we're about to meet the greatest warriors the world has ever known. Legendary. Fashionable. Powerful. Well, I'm sure that was a lot of fun for you. It was. On November 5th, the Marvel Universe... Play nice. ...becomes eternal. So, what's your superpower? You know that your babysitting privileges are completely revoked, right? Marvel Studios Eternals. Rated PG-13. Only in theaters November 5th. Welcome back everyone, this will be my new Eternals trailer video. They released a bunch of new footage just hyping up their powers and comparing them to the Avengers. Like they joke in the trailer, you're about to meet the greatest warriors the world has ever known. I'll also explain what the powers of Kit Harington's Black Knight character are that he gets through the Ebony Blade. So if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. We're gonna have a bunch of Eternal stuff happening really soon because the movie's coming out in a couple weeks. They're using the movie to broaden the Marvel Cosmic Universe, the Cosmic level characters, but also set up a lot of future Marvel Phase 4, Marvel Phase 5 story like mutants, the X-Men characters, and more major cosmic threats like you saw during the Shang-Chi movie. During the Shang-Chi post credit scene, they just hype a big cosmic threat through the Ten Rings from another dimension. So if you're a big fan of the cosmic level storytelling that you've seen so far in the MCU, they're going to be rolling hard on that heading into Avengers 5. But like I said, this brand new trailer is about comparing their team to the Avengers team. That's why Kingo is joking in the trailer, talking to his cameraman, saying, you're about to meet the greatest warriors the world has ever known and most fashionable. Marvel is also calling this trailer the team trailer, like the Eternals team compared to the Avengers team. So it's just a funny way of showing how some of the Eternals characters think of themselves as being on a level way beyond the Avengers because of who they are, where they come from, and how they were created. Thank you for this. Oh, you're welcome. So now that Captain Rogers and Iron Man are both gone, who do you think's gonna lead the Avengers? I could lead them. <laughs> I know there's a big question about who's more powerful, the Eternals or the Avengers, who would win in a fight. I will address that because it largely depends on who's on that Avengers team. The Eternals are this really weird bunch of characters from the comics. They've only crossed over with the actual Avengers a couple times. I know a lot of people have since asked me too on some of my other Eternals videos, is Galactus the one that's growing inside planet Earth? And no, I don't think that's the case. I mean, it would be really cool, but Galactus is a completely different type of character who was created in a very different type of way. He's as old as the universe. It seems that they're going to wait till after the new Fantastic Four movie to introduce MCU Galactus, and they'll probably go with a more comic book accurate backstory for his character, with a couple minor twists. But then the rest of the trailer is mostly dedicated to giving you a tutorial on their powers and how their abilities work, and how they're different from each other. The funny thing in the comics is that actually most of their powers in the comics are pretty much the same. They had to change that for the movie so they just kind of seem like different characters and different personalities. If we're actually comparing them to the Avengers like this trailer is doing, they're way more similar to each other than the Avengers because most of the Avengers come from very different races, different parts of the galaxy, and the Avengers have mostly wildly different powers and different power levels. Like you have the ground level heroes who are just normal people like Hawkeye and Black Widow on the team with cosmic gods like Thor. Whereas the Eternals are all cut from the same celestial cloth, so to speak. And a lot of their passive abilities are the same, it's just for the purposes of the movie, they give them a couple different active powers so that when they're all fighting together as a team, like they have their big Avengers Assemble moments in the trailers, it doesn't look super boring. The passive abilities that they share are that they're all functionally immortal because of the way the Celestials created them to have perfect biology. They're not human, they're just Celestial creations made to look human so that they can blend in on Earth during their mission. That's how you get to people like Thanos, who's an Eternal from Titan, like his parents are Eternals, but they look very different from the Eternals that were sent to Earth. I don't know if they're going to completely get into the whole reincarnation thing during the movie. They might just skip over that, because it seems like if any of them die during the movie, it's not going to be till present day. I know there are all kinds of theories about Salma Hayek's character Ajak, because you don't see her anywhere in any of the other present day fight scenes. Like, what happens to her after she starts talking about the emergence and putting the team together? As they say in the movie though, they're about 7,000 years old when they pick up in present day. They all use celestial energy, cosmic energy as the source of their powers and abilities. That's why all their powers manifest with that yellow energy. There are two different timelines in the movie, or two different story periods. Part of the story takes place in the past and explains how they were created, what their full backstory is, why they were created, and shows them running around the Earth as a full team wrecking the Deviants, like in full-blown Avengers Assemble mode like you saw in the Avengers movies. Thus the comparison to the Avengers. 
Then the other time period they explore is in present day after the blip, after Avengers Endgame, when the emergence is about to happen, when the team has been living apart for hundreds of years, just living amongst humans, all doing their own thing. None of them have spoken to each other for hundreds of years when the movie picks up. Because for a long time, Crow and the Deviants have gone dormant. The Eternals' assistance wasn't really required as much, not counting all the regular wars and events of the Infinity Saga movies, because as they explain, Ershan, the Judge, and the Celestial Host made them take a knee for all those things. The other trailers have given us a pretty good idea for what's going on with all the members of the team when Icarus starts going around in present day trying to do his own Avengers Assemble 2.0. As you can see with all the other references they make to the Avengers, this is all meant to be a parallel for the events of Captain America's Civil War through Avengers Endgame, with the Avengers breaking up for a while, so to speak. A great calamity happening, Thanos and the Snap, and then them bringing the team back together during Avengers Endgame. The Eternals are basically having their own version of that. It's another world-ending threat, the emergence, this celestial that's threatening to emerge from planet Earth and destroy the planet. The Deviants, separately, they're trying to kill humans. In the third threat in the Celestial Host, Ershan the Judge coming to Earth to destroy it if the emergence doesn't go as the Celestials had planned it to. So here we go again, just a bunch of other world-ending disasters. But going around the team, just talking about their major different powers. Icarus can fly and shoot energy beams from his eyes, thus all the Superman jokes. Vision also kind of has his own version of this, except his energy beams come out of his forehead because of the Mind Stone, or if you're talking about White Vision, is the focusing crystal in his forehead. Cersei can transmute matter, that's why you see her turning the bus into flowers, turning the dirt into water, turning the volcanic rocks into birds during this big final battle here. She can also communicate directly with the Celestials in a way the others can't. That's kind of what's going on during this scene. She's communicating with Ershan the Judge, getting orders from him. Ajax's powers manifest a little bit like Doctor Strange's magical shields and projectiles, but Kingo can give off energy bursts and smaller projectiles. You kind of see him doing a Hadouken on one of these deviants. Fastos is their engineer. He creates things, like they have the vibranium joke at the end of that last trailer. But his innate power manifests more like complex drones. Athena manifests that wicked celestial polearm weapon. Gilgamesh is kind of like their version of the Hulk, making more Avengers comparisons. He's the most physically powerful one. He's kind of like their brawler, like a tank if you want to think of them as a raiding party. You can see him reinforcing his arms with celestial shields around them as he starts brawling with one of these deviants. Sprite creates illusions, kind of like Loki's illusions. And even though she looks like a little kid, all of the Eternals are the exact same age. The reason why the Celestials created them to look different is just to help them blend in with the people on planet Earth. This also gets into the idea of what's going on with Makari. So she's their speedster. She has super speed. It's pretty self-explanatory. Notice the way they visualize her super speed powers to be different from the way that MCU Quicksilver's speed looks and the way that X-Men Quicksilver's power looks. You could also make comparisons to The Flash and the way they visualize his speed too. She's also deaf. She's being played by a deaf actress and they will explain in the movie why she is deaf because why would the Celestials create them to have perfect biology then give one of them a disability? They'll explain what happened with that during the course of the film. Druig is telepathic and control people's minds. You kind of see him doing that with his weird little cult that he's living with in present day when they go to try and bring him back for the emergence. He's kind of like the Loki of the family, the true black sheep. Then even though Kit Harrington's black knight character is not an eternal, his powers all come from the ebony blade that's passed down through his family line. The blade comes from the King Arthur Camelot era of history. Marvel does have their own version of those characters. So in the main MCU universe, King Arthur was a real person. Camelot was a real place. The blade is heavily enchanted with a bunch of different abilities, but carries a powerful curse. It's kind of like a Stormbreaker level weapon with many different powers. When the Black Knight is wielding the blade, as long as some part of his body is touching it, he can't be killed. He can also use it to teleport, but it's more like Doctor Strange's portals, not like Stormbreaker opening Bifrost wormholes. And he doesn't need to be touching the blade in order to teleport. He can teleport himself to the blade's location and he can bring the blade to him. He can summon it the way that Thor summons his hammer in Stormbreaker. The blade also protects him from most magical attacks, so like Doctor Strange's magic, maybe even Scarlet Witch's chaos magic wouldn't affect him as much when the blade is on him. It can also feed on the souls of people it kills to enhance its powers, but this also ties in with the curse that it carries. The blade draws out the negative emotions of the wielder, and the more people you kill with it, the more it fills you with the berserker blood rage. So eventually you can lose yourself, so to speak, to the blade. 
If you've ever read the Berserk manga or watched the anime, it's kind of like the Berserker armor. Super powerful, but also kind of works against you if you're not careful. That's why I say you could lose yourself to the blade. Like, eventually the Black Knight, if he succumbed to the curse, he would turn on all the other allies that he's working with and try to kill them too. For those of you asking, who would win in a fight if the Eternals actually fought the Avengers? So the only way the Avengers would have a chance of beating them, because they're so powerful with the celestial technology, the way that they're functionally immortal, would be if the Avengers had all their most powerful members on the team. Like, you'd have to have Thor with Stormbreaker, you'd have to have the Hulk, and it'd have to be Worldbreaker Hulk, you'd have to have Scarlet Witch with her Chaos Magic, Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, and Iron Man and Reed Richards would have to be there and have to have figured out how celestial energy works and found a way to counter it with their technology, or use it against the Eternals. But you can still kill the Eternals, like you can still destroy their bodies. They also have a lot of the petty squabbles that the Avengers have, like they also break up as a team for a period of time. What did I tell you would happen if you ate the last donut with red, white, and blue sprinkles? A little foggy on it, but I think it was something like raining down hellfire. But if you have any big questions about what's going on with their characters or how their powers work, just write them below in the comments and I'll try to address them with my future bonus videos. And we'll get a brand new Spider-Man No Way Home trailer pretty soon, probably a Doctor Strange 2 trailer in the next couple of months as well. There's a low-key Game of Thrones reunion happening in the Eternals movie with Jon Snow and Rob Stark. I just did a big House of the Dragon trailer and Easter eggs video for the Game of Thrones prequel series. Click here for that video and click here for my full Marvel What If Episode 9 finale video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.